as you're probably aware, the fumes from soldering contain a lot of nasty chemicals. This is primarily coming from the flux that's in the solder. But you don't want to breathe these fumes. But if you're like me, with my eyesight nowadays and when working on small components, I tend to put my face right near or right over the top of what I'm soldering. So today we're going to take yet another component from our old Dell server and we're going to turn that into a fan that is going to help keep these odors out and away from our face when soldering. And as a bonus, we're going to add some task lighting to help see better when we are soldering those small components. Hi and welcome to Resin Chem Tech. In a previous video, I took a 15-year-old Dell server that had been sitting in the closet and repurposed the power supply out of that to create a variable benchtop power supply. Today, I'm going to go back to that same server and pull out yet another component and give it new life. Now, with most of my videos, I'll first do a quick highlight overview of the project, then get into the step-by-step -step details. If you wish to jump around, you can always use the timeline down here or the chapter links in the video description. The video description will also contain links to a written version of this that will have parts list, wiring diagrams, code samples, and more. With that, let's get started. So I'll do a quick high-level overview before we get into the individual components. When it's not in use, I just keep the power cords uh, stored here on the back. But this is our 12 volt 5 amp power supply we're going to come off of that and we're going to split that off so we're going to split 12 volts off over here to our fan and our fan can be turned off and on with a toggle switch we have on the side the other split is going to come over here to our controller i'll talk about this quite a bit more in a minute but our controller which is a wemos d1 mini and our led strips are only 5 volt so we're going to use a step down buck converter we're actually going to use another one on the fan as well, but I'll talk about it a little later to step that voltage down to the 5 volts for our controller and our LED lights. And so our, our LED lights over here, we also have a momentary push button that we will use to turn our lights off and on and also control the brightness. Pretty much everything here is scrap parts that I already had laying around or left over from other projects. This is all mounted on a half inch MDF board. These are off of some 1x2 wood I had left over. It makes a nice carrying handle for it when I do want to move it or put it away in storage. And again, I think the only thing that I bought were those two buck converters at about 5 bucks and about 13 bucks for this 12-volt power supply. But that's a quick overview, so now let's take a look at some of the individual components. Well, of course, the first thing we have to do is we have to get the fan out of the computer. Uh, over here is where we had that power supply before that we took out to create our benchtop power supply in that normal video. And this is the fan that we're interested in. So the process will vary somewhat based on your particular computer, but it ought to be very similar to what I do here. So in my case, I have a couple of screws here that need to be loosened to uh, remove the rather large heat sink from over the CPU. So we will just loosen those. Okay, then that hinges back, and now I can also see my wiring uh, coming from the fan to the board, so we need to unplug that. that out of the way. Then I can actually, down here, probably can't see it real, real well, but there's a release tab. So I'm going to hold that up, and the entire fan slides out. It was really that simple. So as you can see here, this is a 12-volt DC fan and will pull up to 1.6 amps uh, when running at full speed. So that would be important information to know. I'm going to remove it from this outer shell uh, by cutting these off. I'll take it outside and clean it up as well. But if we take a look at our wiring, we'll see this one has four wires coming out. What we're primarily going to be interested in is the red 12-volt and the black ground. The other two wires, in this case blue and white, are really... Uh, the PWM control so the motherboard can control how fast the fan is running and a sense wire to report back the RPMs to the motherboard. So we're not going to be interested in those. We will cut this off and once we verify the wiring, we will probably also cut off the blue and the white wire since we won't need those. Okay, so I've taken the fan out of that enclosure, taken it outside and cleaned it up a little bit. And let's give it a quick test. I'm actually going to be using the benchtop power supply we created from that same server uh, that we pulled the fan out of. Got it hooked up to 12 volts here, running into the red and black lead of the fan. So let's turn this on and see what happens. Whoa! That thing is really, really strong and has a lot of power. And you can see we're pulling about 1.7 amps on this right now. 
at 11.4 volts. So let's hook this, take this apart, hook it up to the variable side, see if we can crank that voltage down a little bit to stop this thing from walking across the desk. It's also a little bit noisy if you can hear that. So maybe we can slow it down a little bit and reduce some of that noise. Okay, I've moved our uh, power source over here to the variable side and I've set this to around 9 volts to start. And so let's turn that on, see if we can maybe control the speed and some of the sound of this fan. Okay, there we are at 9 volts and again pulling about 1.2 amps. That's still, still pretty fast and again I don't know how well the microphone is picking up the noise. I would like for it to be a little bit quieter and it is pulling quite a bit of air. So let's, if I can get my hand out of the way here, let's turn this voltage down a little bit. We can definitely control the speed of the fan. You also see that our amps are dropping. Let's try somewhere around 7 volts here. Okay, that seems to be about right. I think the noise level is pretty good. We see the fan's no longer, it's moving a little bit, but at least it's not throwing itself off the desk. Just out of curiosity, let's go ahead and turn this down. See how low we can go here before the fan. We're down to 6 volts. Take this all the way down to 5. And I can tell you that the fan is now barely running and I think it would have a problem. In fact, it sounds like it's actually going to stop. And there it goes, it stops. So I would say that probably somewhere around uh, 7 volts or so is where we want to set this thing. So since we can vary the voltage here, we have a couple of options. Uh, we could use a variable step-down buck converter or even something like a potentiometer if we actually want to be able to adjust the speed of the fan. And like I said, I think uh, they're around 7 volts. Uh, didn't seem to have any problems starting up. And I think the noise level is acceptable. And we'll do a little smoke test, but uh, I think that's going to, to pull the fumes just fine. So let's take a look at the controller board. This is very similar to the normal WLED controller board that I normally create with a few key differences. For one, we've got 12 volts coming in because we're going to use 12 volts to power our fan. And of course, our Wemos D1 Mini or our LEDs that I'm using are only 5 volt. So we're going to use this variable step down buck converter that will take anything from 4.5 volts in to 28 volts in and we can step that down to anything between 0.8 and 20 volts. So by using this little set screw, we can take our 12 volts in and feed 5 volts out. Now our 5 volts out is going to feed our Wemos D1 Mini. It's also going to feed out to our LED strip. And here in the middle, of course, is my logic level shifter. Now again, I know you don't always need to use a logic level shifter. I like to use one because it's going to shift my 3.3 volt signal for my LEDs up to 5 volts when we run out. I also have a optional 1000 microfarad uh, capacitor in here that's just to help even out the power. You don't have to have that. Sometimes I include it, sometimes I don't. Of course, we're not going to be using WLED. We're going to be using ESP Home. But as far as, as the wiring here, it's still pretty much the same. Now, I'm also going to have a push button out here. And for that, you see I've got three wires coming out. Uh, my ground, my signal, and in this case, a 5 volt out. And it just so happens that the button that I have is an LED illuminated button. So I'm going to go ahead and run 5 volts out of that so we can light up the little ring. If you just have a non-illuminated push button, you wouldn't need this 5 volt line. You would just need the signal in the ground. Now, I said that we're going to run the power out to our LEDs. And if you've seen my other videos, I normally talk about you don't want to run a lot of current through these boards. They're just not rated to handle high current. In my case, I'm going to be using 48 LEDs, which at full white bright is somewhere just north of 3.5 amps. That is probably pushing the limit for this board. And our buck converter is only rated for 3 amps. So there's a couple of things that I've done. First of all, I've went ahead and bridged a couple of connections and I've run wire over here to help with the higher current. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to limit the brightness of our LEDs to about 85% and that should take us down to about two and a half amps which between bridging the connections here and the three amp rating on this ought to be okay. So here are the LEDs mounted to the front of my station and I opted to use it once again my aluminum LED channel that I've used in a lot of my projects. Now I'm not sure since this stuff is relatively expensive not not sure I would have purchased it just for this project but I had extra laying around so I decided to go ahead and use that we're just going to solder our connections together 
And again, we have the, the optional diffusers that we can put on here. I'm using 100 LEDs per meter. For this particular project, I'm really interested in uh, the amount of light and really just white light. I'm not looking to have all the different colors and effects of WLED, which is another reason why we're going to use uh, ESP Home. I briefly mentioned this earlier, but I actually am using a second uh, buck converter here. This is my toggle button for my fan. I'm going to come off of that uh, to this buck converter. And the reason why is when this fan was running at full 12 volts, it was extremely powerful. And in fact, before it was mounted in here, it would actually walk itself across the desk. And it was also made it very noisy. So I didn't need it running quite that high. So by using this buck converter, I can actually step the voltage down a little bit, slow the fan down, and also make it a little bit quieter. Now, you don't want to set that too low because it may not have enough oomph to get the fan started. I think I have this set to somewhere around 7.5, maybe 8 volts coming out of here. That gives me a nice balance between enough fan speed to, to suck the fumes away, but also not being too awful loud. If you do want to have variable speed control and be able to easily change the speed of your fan, as opposed to using this little tiny set screw, you can replace this second buck converter with a PWM motor control. It's wired in in really the same way. We have our 12 volts coming in and then we go out to our fan, but this will allow you to adjust that speed uh, and easily change it. Do not make the mistake I made of trying to use a standard potentiometer like this. I decided to forget Ohm's law and ended up running about 19 watts of power through something rated for about an eighth of a watt. And that is one sure way to generate some magic blue smoke. Adding the variable speed control will cost you a couple bucks more. At the time of this recording, this was around $2 and this was around $4. So it's a couple of extra bucks. And technically, you could use a PWM pin off of your ESP8266, but that now means you're going to have to go to an app to change the speed of your fan. And I want to keep everything local without the need for an app. And here's why I went ahead and swapped out that uh, buck converter for this PWM control. Uh, again, if I were building this today, I would build this a little bit different so this isn't hanging off the side. But it does give me variable speed control. I don't know how, how well you can hear that. But I can go from very, very uh, fast speeds all the way down to slow speeds using this PWM motor control. To mount the fan to the base, I actually used the existing mounting holes that were in the fan. Uh, 3D printed a couple of just little, short little angle brackets to line up with those holes to mount it to the base. I also printed this bracket to hold some speaker mesh in place across the back of the fan. Now the speaker mesh is not acting as a filter. It's not like it's charcoal activated or anything. It's really just there as a safety precaution to stop from inadvertently putting your fingers or having any, any small parts fall into the backside of the moving fan blade. So if you've watched any of my other LED videos, you know that I love to use WLED firmware on my ESP boards to control the LED lighting because WLED has lots of effects and lots of features, but in this particular case, we're really interested in task lighting, which primarily means white. So in this case, I'm going to be using ESP Home on my board instead. One of the reasons for using ESP Home is it allows me to run automations locally on the ESP board itself without needing to rely on Home Assistant or any external app. Now, we can still integrate this into Home Assistant if we really want to turn the lights blue or green or something like that, but the fact that we don't need Home Assistant, we can process all those button presses right on the ESP8266 board itself gives us a huge advantage. So for those of you that are interested, I'm going to quickly show the ESP Home code up here. If you're not interested in that, again, feel free to use the links down here along the timeline to skip this part. So I'm not going to cover the top part of ESP Home. Uh, this framework more or less gets created for you, joins your Wi-Fi. There are a couple of things that you'll need to change. Uh, if, for example, you're not using Home Assistant, so you'd want to disable the, the API, but all that's covered on the ESP Home site. What we're really interested in are the custom components of the code that we add to this. We've got our light, which is our LED strip. Uh, I'm using NeoPixel Bus. There is a fast LED library, but apparently as of the time of this recording, it has some issues with the current Arduino framework. So we're going to use the NeoPixel Bus. We're just going to tell it, much like we do with uh, WLED, the type of strip that we're running, which pin we're using for our data pin. We're going to give an ID, which is going to be locally for use in our automations, a name, which is what will be represented in Home Assistant if we're going to integrate this with Home Assistant. And then we have our first actual automation that's going to run locally. 
This is saying on turn on, that's more or less of our trigger. If you're familiar with home assistant automations, we're saying when the light is turned on, then I'm going to automatically set the brightness to 85%. That's my, remember that's my limiting factor to make sure I keep the amps low enough. So the brightness, anytime the lights are turned on will be set to 85%. Now we have our binary sensor or that push button that's on the side. Again, we're gonna tell it what pin it's hooked up to. In my particular case, in the pin number that I use, I needed to invert the button. If you find the button is working backwards in the logs when it says off when it should be on, you can invert it. Uh, again, we're gonna give it a, an ID for use in, in our local automations. Uh, 50, second, 50 millisecond delay just stops any bouncing that might happen. But then we have the actual automations. Now I'm gonna use an on-click trigger. Uh, you can also use an ESP on, they've got on multi-click, they've got on press, they've got on release. So there are multiple ways to do this, just like there are multiple triggers in Home Assistant. But in my case, I'm gonna say on click, if the length of that click, the time you press the button to release the button is between 80 and 800 milliseconds. So more or less just under a second, we're gonna treat that like a single click and we're gonna to toggle the state of our lights. We're either gonna turn them on if they're off or turn them off if they're on. If our click length is between, between the time we press and release is between one and two seconds, we're gonna treat that like a long press. And in this case, we're basically just gonna dim the lights by 20%. Once it gets down to zero, it won't go negative and won't crash and burn. But that's gonna be our dim button. So we can just hold the button down for one, one and a half seconds, release it. And every time we do that, the lights will dim by 20%. We wanna reset it back to 85%, turn them off, turn them back on again. But it's pretty simple, but again, the big advantage is that we can run these automations locally on the chip. We don't need Home Assistant and we don't need an external app to be able to control those LED lights. So let's take a look at the completed project. Again, our fan is going to be controlled by this toggle button on the side. So I can simply flip that on. And again, it's a fair amount of suction without uh, being too noisy. So that was the balance between the two. Our LED lights are controlled by our push button over here and a long press will slowly dim those lights and again a single press to turn them back off and back on again. Considering the fact that I had almost all of these parts it was probably less than a $20 project and it is nice and portable with this little handle at the top uh, it can easily be moved around it can be stored. It was a fairly quick and fairly cheap project to help keep those solder fumes out of my face. And although we don't need Home Assistant, the fact that we're using ESP Home, it does natively integrate into Home Assistant. So if you really want to, you can bring these entities into Home Assistant, like you can see here, and I can actually uh, turn my lights on on my soldering fan. I can actually bring this up. I can control the brightness on it. Uh, I can even change colors if I want to go with different colors uh, for those particular lights. Anything you could do with an RGB strip. Uh, again, you can do here now through Home Assistant, but Home Assistant isn't required to make the fan work. So at this point, we've taken this old 2006 Dell server that was sitting in a closet not being used, and we've created a benchtop power supply and now a soldering fan station. And while the case is starting to look a little bit empty, I think there's still a few components in here that we can repurpose and give new life to. So that's going to do it for this project. It's definitely not my prettiest or fanciest build, but again, I was going for function over form for this one and for the goal of trying to keep components out of going into a, a landfill or to the recycler and finding new life for them. If you found anything in this video that you liked, do me a favor and hit that thumbs up button. That lets me and YouTube know you'd like to see more videos like this. And if you like, subscribe to my channel and ding that little bell icon if you want to be notified when I release new videos. As always, I would like to say thank you for watching and I hope to see you soon.